How are you? I'm not too bad. I, um, I've been doing a bit more self-inquiry, but um, um, I, I do kind of, what is this? And who, who am I? Or what am I? Um, mm-hmm. It's now then. Um, not a lot comes up. Um, but I've, I've been kind of doing more systematic sort of um, what am I by working out what I'm not. Mm. Um, and I came to a place where I sort of thought, well, you know, I thought, well, I'm not my body because, you know, there's nothing left of my body um, compared to, say, five years ago or something. Mm-hmm. So I thought, okay, well, what if I'm a changing thing? What if I'm a thing that isn't, isn't always stable? Mm-hmm. So then I thought a different question would be, well, what is the core of me? What is uh, mm-hmm. what is stable with me? And, and then I couldn't I couldn't find anything but awareness, which doesn't have any qualities. Uh, specific quality, yeah. Specific qualities that can yeah that, that, that um, define you. Hmm. Yeah, because mm-hmm. I can. Uh, I'm. I'm still doing my my. This week in in my uh, meditation course, we've got to do more group awareness exercises. So we work in groups, and mm-hmm. we sort of we try and get in contact with um, awareness, and we say what it is. Mm-hmm. Of course, we we're, we're indirectly uh, trying to get in contact with it through how it contacts something else and our experiences that and then we're and then we're describing what it is through metaphor mm. <laughs> so it's a strange thing but it's kind of like apparently apart from the kind of um methods like watching the breath and stuff mm. this method can really transition people oh okay oh, yeah, yeah. Which, which is quite interesting because i guess you like with the watching the breath and stuff you're getting near it when you're watching just a single thing it's just that single thing the words yeah slowed down. I guess when you're trying to find out what when it says you can kind of get near it. Mm. Or need to get near it. Okay. And I guess it's just sort of something happens on the other end to let you through. <laughs> okay. Nice. Out of control. That's that's what I yeah, that's what I keep hearing that ultimately it's not your you know, ultimately the individual doesn't decide. Mm-hmm. But you can do things to support the process. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, it's been interesting. I did. Um, I had I heard a lot of people in my group talk about kind of uh, you know when to love efforts and just I just not get in contact with like that. And then there were times when I did get in contact with, uh, which was nice, kind of being blocked with the group members and so on. Nice. But what I did notice was that ultimately, whatever I described, it was like, it felt like it was through metaphor using language I knew, and it was like, um, it was like I was describing this thing that I could only see in shadow form with without the word shadow, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, not, without any words that could directly describe it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, you know. But it's it's been interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's mainly what's happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, yeah, I, I, I got a bit stuck on the world, you know, what if I'm a thing that changes? What if I'm not mm-hmm. Maybe I'm like this thing that constantly changes. So the question had to be had to be altered to be what what within me is always the same. Hmm. Or what I what am I without any ideas about what I am? Yeah, then that becomes a kind of experience of it, doesn't it? 
Yeah, the answer is experiential. The awakening shift is experiential, right? As you know, but it's tricky, right? Because, um, excuse me, excuse me. Um, it's tricky because, you know, we get, you know, certain groups we do and stuff, not to say there's no value to it, but it's, you could start to see that, oh, we're trying to describe something that can't be described, which maybe has immense value, you know, I don't really know. But the way I guess uh, my approach with this is more like a direct approach of like getting beyond even those ideas of what this is. And, you know, it depends where somebody's at. Sometimes you need to sort of almost develop these ideas and these uh, about things to have a way of orienting, right? To have a way of orienting away from the busy, chattery mind of myself and my problems, right? So it could be very useful, right? As a step in that direction. But ultimately at some point we come to this place where I think it's really valuable to just radically be like, well, what am I without any of those thoughts? And, you know, speaking from my path, whether, you know, I again, like everybody has their own way of orienting towards the truth of awakening in this um, context. But I don't think that, you know, I, I think it is a radical approach in one sense to just not do any spiritual stuff or whatever, but really just go to the heart of it and ask the like direct questions more. Um, it, it sort of is a radical approach, but it doesn't mean that it's, ex it, that somebody has to be ready for it, uh, or that it's excluded of some people. You know where I'm going with that? Like, I guess it's it's coming from this, for me, like I, I came from not any spiritual background, not knowing anything about non-duality, and all I did was sit and ask who am I for, for four months, and I didn't settle on any intellectual answer. That's all I did, was like, what am I without thought? What am I without thought? And then, you just kind of what way yeah yeah you just sit it just for me it became yeah it became like in the beginning it was like tricky it was hard because my mind was busy and so I would sit and ask who am I and I sort of had this question with me all the time like what am I without thought I had it on the back of my kindle it's still a sticky note five years later on the back of my Kindle, but it's really cute. It's like, what am I without the stories I tell of myself, without any thoughts, without any memories? What am I? And um, it was really valuable because it was just it was just like no bullshit kind of direct or like, I don't know if direct is the right word. Maybe it is. It was just direct. It was just like, what am I? But in the beginning, I did have like thoughts and memories and I would just be like, okay, I would just keep going, returning to the question, returning to the question. When my mind was busy, I would return to the question. And then if I had memories or traumatic things and memory come up that were emotionally charged, I would go and lay in the bed and, and deal with them and cry and experience it, whatever I needed to do. And for me in that period, there was a lot of different memories that came up like, oh, I feel shame. Oh, I feel like I'm this person that's like lived the shameful life. I'm this person that's like those identities, that sort of thing was coming through. And then when I was, you know, um, emotionally balanced, um, I would go sit again and just sit and who am I? And I would wander in thought and I would bring myself back and I would wander in thought and stay in thought and stay in thought for a day. And it was fine. But I just, when I could reorient to that question, I just always did. Just who am I? What am I without thought? What am I without thought? And it was always for me, it was 24 seven. That's the only thing I was focused on. And it was four months. And at some point it, it just became quieter and quieter and quieter until the gap between a charged emotional experience or um, a memory that's really taking my attention or something to think about um, just became quieter and quieter. And then one day I just stood up and it was the most obvious thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, there's so much out there and now as a teacher myself, I recommend different things and people need different things along their path, but you know, it's, and I, I think the reason why I'm compelled to share with you this part of that part of the journey for me is that you feel like to me, like you're, you know, I'm sure you're going to finish the course and whatever you're doing and, and it has its value. 
but you feel it feels to me like you're like why am i creating this something that doesn't need to be created right like it, it partly i feel like you're resonating with more a direct direct path yeah yeah I guess it would have to be one of my as well without, without emotions, one of mine without yeah. sensations, one of mine without tastes, perhaps one of them. Yeah, but I, I would wait for those, to be honest, because maybe maybe mix emotion and thought together if that resonates, but like ultimately all of the other senses, the the um say realization uh, unfolding in the other sense experiences or the other experiences of being here, being human, um, they, they unfold or untangle identity untangles from it so much easier after first awakening, after you are de-identified with thought, after that energetic shift has really happened, then it's much easier to see emotion for what it is or sound for what it is or sensation for what it is. But when you're still really identified with thought, I would spend almost all of my time, like I said, what I did for four months is just with the with the one question that really resonated with me. Uh, who am I really resonated with me? You know, um, and it, it it what the value of the, that type of question is is to not make any sense for your mind to go, what the hell? That I can't find an answer to that. You know, because because the mind came up with like, oh, I'm a wife. I'm a this, I'm a that. And then I remember one day I was like texting Angela and I was like, oh my God, I thought I was looking for something I actually am, like one thing that I am. And what I think I am is a whole bunch of things. Um, a, uh, you know, a wife, a dog mom, a whatever ideas I had about, you know, I was all of those things, a picky eater, all these things, not just one identity, right? So yeah, I think to me, I think that's the most valuable, just direct approach. And then there's a lot of nuances and other things that are valuable after first awakening. Yeah. So I'm just, it sounds like what you did was even when you wash the dishes or something, you and then. Yeah, it wasn't necessarily that I was asking it verbally all the time, internally or externally. It was just that my heart was just, it was just this pull to like, always be looking for truth for what am I, right? Like it was just sort of like the direction of my heart was like, this makes sense, I'm gonna figure this out, like through my heart. So I was always sort of aware of like, how am I behaving? How am I responding to others? Who am I thinking I am right now? All, like I always just vigilant, you know, which is not the funnest path for anybody, but it was straightforward and direct and it worked. Then it was, you know, sort of concentrated amount of it because I didn't have, I didn't have a social life. I didn't, my husband had moved away. So I didn't have my husband to take care of. I didn't have a job. So I had a lot of free time. And that's the only thing I, I cared about. I was like, I just, I'm just tired of suffering. I just need to figure this thing out and then the rest of my life can do what it needs to do. But I couldn't go and create anything else in the rest of my life until I figured this out. And I knew that because I knew it was that one thing I was avoiding all my life for so many years. And now was this opportunity when I didn't have any other external responsibilities. I felt like this grand opportunity to really do it. Did you, did you get a sense of what if, what if I never get the opportunity? Um, yeah, yeah, I had, I had a lot of, re, a lot of release when uh, frustration came, took over me and it was like, well, what if I never, what if I suffer for the rest of my life? What if I never know? What if I never end suffering? That was so valuable. There was so much release in that like, okay, well, what if, would I be okay with it? Yeah, letting go of even the one that wants to wake up at some point, the one that wants to get this right, the one that wants to do this. So if I sit here and let's say one month, the first thing is going to be all of It's okay. that, that thought that I can see a bud. Okay. I guess I'm um, but I have 
Yeah, but look at look at it directly. What is this hand without any thoughts? Without the label hand, without the label body, without the label distance. There's just that experience there. Yeah, pretty similar experience to experiencing you on the screen. <laughs> exactly. There's just an experience there before we label it with anything through the mind. That, that I would say, is non-dual uh, investigation, which really, like I said, is really it really is easier after first awakening. First awakening, I would direct somebody to more keep looking at thought. Like, don't worry about the physical body yet. There's a, it's like, you know, it goes in different, it goes in different sort of orders, but there's the intellectual self. And first awakening is what we're talking about when we say awakening from the intellectual self, from the thought that says, I am Sarah in a body separate to all of life. That's the thought we're waking up from. That's the identity the first awakening is geared towards waking up from, right? The thought scape of all the memories, all the visual thought memories, imaginations, hopes and desires, all of that is in the thought space, right? It's not in the body space. You could say the mind's in the body, sure, but you know what I mean, right? It's not in this, this expression. It's in here. It's a story. Right. And de-identifying from that is say first awakening. And then after that, it's you either wake up, there's like a heart awakening that happens. Um, for me, I think mind and heart woke up at the same time. And it just felt really expanded. And I think that's common maybe um, to some extent. And even now my heart is still sort of awakening and being open to being seen and so forth. Right. But really that intellectual, um, moving from the intellectual space of identity is crucial for then other, other things to be worked out, so to speak. So somebody leading up for first awakening, I would really direct to just like, look at thought, like rest, you know, and I think it's what, what, what maybe we're using the term of awareness, right? The space that feels like here-ness, the something that's here, the something that's aware here. Awareness, consciousness, I would use them interchangeably here, but there's a, it feels like a spatial quality, right? Of something aware here, and then the thoughts arise in this, right? And when it's quiet, when there's less thought, you're almost just resting in awareness or resting in consciousness, right? And then when there's more thought and you grab a thought or identify with a thought, then it feels like that thought has become way bigger. It becomes the, it's almost like um, you're looking through a small lens when you're looking through the thought. And when the thought's quieter, you're looking through a way bigger lens, right? But it's still both qualities happen in this sort of space of consciousness. So if I know what am I and Look, yeah, like move, move towards that thought. Aren't you curious what that thought is made out of? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So move towards it. Use your scientific direction to move towards, to see what it is. Not the body, but the thought that says I am the body. Don't worry about the body yet. Just look at the thought that says, I'm a body. What is it? What is it? What is the experience of the thought that says, I am the body? Oh. Mm -hmm. And what is a thought? And what does it touch? Does it have any edges? Does the thought have any edges? Does it have any structure?
I am the body, do you find yourself in that thought? Okay. So what's left when you don't find yourself in that thought? Or when you don't know what that thought is even referring to? That's another thought. So now look inside the body experientially, your attention and the experience of inside the body. So there's an experience of inside the body. Sure. Okay. But is that you? Okay, now let's look at that thought. Maybe all of these sensations are me together. What is that thought touching? What is it referring to? Does it have any substance to it? It's a thought. Okay. So that's not the answer then, right? So what are you left with? Your sound is really low, Sarah. I don't know why. Is that better? That's better. That's better. Right. Just increased my, yeah, your volume. That's interesting. You That's can hear me? A, yeah. So. So since I have it here, yeah, I can identify thought. Mm-hmm. It, the volume's weird. I think it's when you go further away from the computer or something. It, it, I don't mm. know. It drowns. Point of Sorry. That's all right. That's better. That's all right. Yeah. Maybe I'll move up really close as well. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm like, I feel tingling in my toe, mm -hmm. me, and I feel kind of uh, tension in my knees. Mm -hmm. That's, and then mm -hmm. I think, oh, okay, but maybe both of them together and me. Um, okay. So look at that thought. That's a thought. Yeah. But what is the thought referring to? Thoughts referring to itself. Thing that comes and goes, yeah, in consciousness. Mm -hmm. So, what are you left with when you don't catch those thoughts and take yourself to be them? An empty space and not being able to answer the question, mm -hmm. which is <laughs> right, right, and and that's. Um, that's partly the language of just sharing because we're in session together. But when you're with yourself and you're there and you you're not, you know, with someone else, you're, you're by yourself and you're there and, and you, you can't answer that question. Are you then believing the answer? It's an empty space that, that I can't really answer because that's another thought too, right? Ultimately. Yeah. No, I'm just trying to think. Yeah. trying to find the answer yeah but i think what's clarified today is is if if i come to a so i came to kind of dead end where i where i thought well what if i am changing things you know that includes tingling yeah. so sometimes not other times that includes 
you know, long hair, short hair. Um, Who's the one that's trying to figure it out? Who's the one that's looking for the answer? The same one that thought that I was posing a question. <laughs> but what is that? I think dead end is a good word for it because that's what this type of inquiry is for is to is to dead end the mind it's like uh well and then don't fix that confusion don't fix that uh well let yourself dissolve into that so I end up with a I don't know, mm -hmm. which is yep. I end up with a series of ideas which are all thoughts, mm -hmm. and I just keep asking. But I think what's solidified for me today is the answer has to be experiential, mm -hmm. has to be something that that is not thought. Exactly. Yeah. Where I Every question I've ever experienced in my life, it's supposed to come with a thought as a response. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> right. That's exactly it. You're right on the money there, Sarah, because and that's why people say, I don't resonate with who am I? Well, nobody resonates with who am I? Because it's not for you. It's for the dissolution of you. Which we all ha will will resist at some point. But that's why it's a very simple and potent and powerful question. Because it leads you to a dead end. It leads you to the dead end that on the other side, the, the other edge of that is, I can't explain what. But it leads you to that dead end versus certain questions. You can find answers. You can even find qu answers to who am I. But if, you, yeah. if you're vigilant and if you really are doing it like skillfully where you're like really, excuse me, you can sometimes it's really hard to see all thought as thought. There's certain thoughts we can go, okay, well, those are thoughts. But what about the thinker, right? It's hard to see that the thinker itself is a thought. The one that thinks it's listening to Violet talk right now is also another thought. The one that thinks I am meditating right now, that's also another thought. But we believe that thought, so then we believe all the rest of them. Or sometimes we can see the peripheral thoughts that they are thoughts, but the thoughts that are so intimately here, they don't seem like thoughts because they seem like me. They seem like experiences of me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of what the ego is, I suppose. It's in a hardened set of thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I like I like the kind of whenever I'm whatever I'm doing during the day, I'm thinking who am I and, and the as in kind of what am I what, what am I really trying to be right now when I interact with the postman yeah thank you what am I trying to be when I say thank you mm -hmm. yeah that's interesting it's almost like yeah it, it doesn't answer the question but the answers are kind of it's basically kind of what roles do I take on yeah yeah and it's yeah. like the other thing that's tricky about this is that Every question in our whole lives can be answered. We could figure it out somehow, right? But this actually, it's not even, it's not even supposed to be answered in that way. It's just supposed to be asked over and over and over again, <laughs> which seems completely weird and backwards, but that's what's valuable, right? Cause it's totally a different approach than any, all, all the mechanisms, all the tools, everything we've learned, all the skills we've learned in our life, of how to approach this moment, how to approach problem solving, how to approach relationship, how to approach anything we need to approach in our life, in our relative life. All of those tools, not one of them will work here. And that is frustrating. Absolutely. Because it leaves you with this, 
I have this massive toolbox and none of them work here. And we keep trying to think, okay, maybe this will work. Maybe this will work. Maybe this will work. And you keep going to dead ends, right? You keep going, well, none of those work. Or maybe I think they work, but I'm fooling myself. But I promise you, none of them will work here. They're beautiful tools. You're just using, it's like using a, a screwdriver to hammer in a nail. It's, it's like absurd. And there, and then we think, okay, then, then the answer to that, Violet, is that there should be a tool that will work for this. But no, the actual answer is there isn't anything that will work for this. If anything will work for this is orienting, is, is being vigilant and noticing that when we're trying to identify with using a tool, with using a something and letting go of it, notice it, let it let go of itself and orient to that space of I'm fucking confused and I don't know what. And it feels quite uncomfortable actually. Maybe a little peaceful sometimes, but it's this like, uh, what is the word? Tetra, uh, I can't, I can't think of that word, but like, um, unsteady. It's peaceful. Oh, it's really uncomfortable. It's peaceful. It's really uncomfortable. Right. And don't, uh, and, and just let that be like, don't fix that because the mind goes, Oh, I don't know the answer. That's a problem. Let me try to fix it. What I'm saying is just don't fix it. Just stay there in that unknown, that edge of the lake where you have no idea if you're going to fall in or you're going to go back onto the land. You have no idea what's next. It's just whew, breathe through it. Let yourself be there. That's where that fear barrier is that Angela talks about quite a bit. And we sling back often into a way of orienting. Well, I could do this other meditation that makes me feel good. And there's tons of meditations and practices that do make you feel good, that do make you feel like you're getting somewhere. But ultimately, what's radically different about non-duality as a practice or as an expression is it gets you nowhere. It leads you to death, ultimately, to the self dissolving or not even something that dies ultimately, but seeing what it really is, and then it collapses, the structure of it. But it's it's radical and potent in that way, which is hugely valuable. It works, it really works. If you really, if it really resonates with you to be with the radical side of non-duality, then go for it because it's really works. And I'm not saying that it's a better path, some people, it's just a karmic unfolding of spiritual awakening. Some people need to awaken through different practices in different ways first before they can really let go of ego, really let go of that structure of identity. But some of us really resonate with, I'm tired of doing anything else that kind of reconstructs a self, but now maybe it's a spiritual self and I'm ready to just let go of it all. And it's radical. I'm wary of constructing spiritual self absolutely very well yeah. but I see people all around me just kind of yeah. construct totally basic ego listen it's not just a spiritual ego yeah and they build their whole lives in their different yeah, and, and I would say as far as ego is concerned, maybe spiritual ego is slightly more better way to live life, but it could be very bad, worse way because there's a lot of I'm better than thou within that stuff too. So, you know, maybe it's better, but um, it's also still identity. And it's, it, in my opinion, in my experience, identity itself, um, with having any identity itself is suffering. It always leads to disappointment and suffering. Freedom comes from no self, from no identity at all, no identity structure at all, which is radical. It's really radical. It's really, so it's this natural surrender moment to moment into life, into life, into the unknown, not planning your life, not knowing what to do. And it doesn't mean that things don't get taken care of, but it means that, <laughs> There's just, you just see, there's just like nothing in this for me. And that sounds terrible when we talk to, you know, somebody in spiritual community or somebody in just normal community, right? It's like, what, what do you mean? Like you don't care about your life anymore, but it's, it's radically peaceful. I could tell you that from experience. It's radically peaceful that I don't give a fuck where this life goes for Violet. It doesn't matter to me at all. Like that's the most uninteresting thing. 
right? And it does sound radical, and it is, but it's so peaceful. It's great. Because I suffered and struggled so hard when I was trying to make Violet's life this thing that I thought, how do I find her sole purpose? How do I figure out how... And I don't have to worry about any of that anymore. And in <laughs> paradoxically so, in in the uh, the gift of that type of letting go, that radical letting go, is this uh, life is creating itself within this expression of Violet's life in all of the things that Violet likes to do. And I couldn't have constructed this better. When I had my hands in it, when I had skin in the game, it was always off. And anything I was doing, whether it was relationship or work or career or whatever I was doing, mothering the dogs, it was always off in some way because it was about me. It was what was I getting from it. And living a life through this creative expression just comes naturally. What comes naturally, what is supposed to be, say, maybe soul's purpose, I don't know. I don't really usually speak that way, but comes naturally. It comes through the vessel that's now empty, however it wants. And there's nothing here that manipulates it or wants it to be a certain way or wants certain experiences and not other experiences. Life itself through this vessel is in full acceptance of all experience, even the challenging ones. That's interesting, yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm wary of this, uh, this soul purpose thing, absolutely. Yeah, totally. It, it can be a real, I think, I can see how the people around like my meditation teacher and so on, that I've had for years, yeah. she, she really wants to awaken, she always wants to awaken, but yet she's got this really good, solid soul Hi, baby, oh my god, the cutest face! <gasps> Sarah, she has the cutest face! She's very pretty. Oh my God, pretty girl. You pretty girl. You know, cats, I love dogs a lot, but cats are definitely like angels. They're definitely like have this, I don't know, divine thing going on. Oh my gosh, pretty lady. What's her name? I, Luna. I Luna. love I love dogs. They're just so faithful and things like that, whereas cats just do that own they are so spiritual beings like dogs are dogs are more domestic they're more in the relative i think cats are totally like extraterrestrial beings i swear it yeah <laughs> love them yeah 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 interesting with the spiritual teacher because she's just she talks regularly about how you know she really wants to wait so a life purpose is to be a meditation teacher and I think, okay, you know, where did you pick that out of the sky from? Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah. And even if they get your life purpose is to awaken, that's double it, isn't it? Mm. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, everybody has their own journey, so I don't like to judge anybody. But it's it's really like I I felt that in myself. I mean, for years, like I went to this holistic healing school. I was trying to find like what was going to be my thing, and. <laughs> I loved this thing that I was doing and I loved this thing that I was doing and I loved all the things that I was doing, but I also hated all the things that I was doing. And it was because of that sense of trying to find myself in something else. It didn't fit. It felt off. It felt really weird to me. It felt really like depressing to me. And it weighed me down, weighed me down until I finally was like, okay, husband's gone. I'm alone. Who the fuck am I really? Like, let me, instead of going to try to find myself in some other thing, like I could have fortified it a life for myself, right? I could have created a spiritual or not even spiritual, but I could have created a social circle. I could have went and made friends. I could have went to work again. I could have went back to school. I could have done anything to fortify a sense of purpose in my life, but I didn't. Instead, I was like, wow, this is a huge freaking opportunity. And it was hard part of my life. That was the hardest thing when my husband left. But I was like, okay, I just knew in my heart this was the this was the opportunity to turn to that thing that I knew was always there that I avoided by trying to find myself in all these other things. So instead of going and making a self of myself when my life had no self, really, my I, I didn't have a I was a no one. I didn't have anything external that was making me something. Right? I didn't have a relationship, I didn't have friendships, I didn't have work. Those are the three things that make us really a someone. 
in the relative life. And so all I had was to sit there with my cats and my dogs and go, what the hell is this? Yeah, you know, it'd be identify where you yeah. have identify every person. Mm -hmm. And I just sort of, yeah, since I've kind of, um, I spent a number of years working with a, a couple of spiritual teachers who, but over the years, I kind of, I started off by working more and more with them, which became bigger and bigger part of my life. Yeah. And everything else seemed less and less important. And then mm -hmm. um, I started to see more and more of their human side. Um, and yeah. just one thing after another piled up. And it got to the point where something tipped. Yeah. And I just now just don't, I just don't trust them. And I guess I kind of had to trust them to be part of this thing that I thought I wanted to head to, mm -hmm. which I ultimately see was, was kind of about a sort of very, a very very early stage child thing just wanting to belong yeah which is sort of the idea yeah totally to find your group i really mm -hmm. see that and i just really moved away from that and mm -hmm. and that means i'm left with because i've kind of abandoned all this other stuff i have a have a husband but i'm not a wife yeah i, I am on paper it means nothing to me yeah I, well, I've never really identified with my work too much, and I don't do it too much. Mm -hmm. So there is space, it's kind yeah, of... totally. What, yeah. what could it be? And I can completely see how it could be easily filled with any, anything I create, or just a story. I, I don't even yeah. do it. I can go out and do something, really, that's what I am like. Yeah, of course. I, I would just create a story around what I already do. Um, yeah. But that doesn't seem satisfying. So there is this. Yeah. There is. This, You're ready. I could feel it. Yeah. This opening. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So just, uh, just to stick with the question. But yeah. Also, yeah. I, I like the idea of I. I really get now the kind of there's a way in which I think that I've been. Um, uh, there, 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 there have been. Uh, yeah, some resistance as well. Yeah, well, and that's and that happens how it happens. Like I'm, I'm a big believer of everything happens for a reason. Like it happens in its perfect timing. Like I don't know, maybe two months ago, this conversation we didn't have because you it, something wasn't ready for it. Something needed to uh, awaken in some other way or or see something in another way. Like I think you know this course that you're doing has really helped you. It seems like it's really helped you because you're like, wait, what am I trying to make out of anything? And it's really yeah. get, it's got you to this place where you're like, now, now I can have this sort of radical question, this conversation with you. And like, we can't predict when that's ready, when somebody's ready for that. And when they're not, you know, it just happens when, when it happens. But if the, it's like strike when the iron's hot, Angela says that, that one. And it is, if you're really like, kind of like, uh, I don't really care about all this other shit. How do I just actually do the thing? <laughs> and then let's ride the roller coaster. You know what I mean? Like, let's just get on. <laughs> like, you know, well, what if I just never find out? You know, yeah. is this not a waste of time? Well, mm -hmm. well, what could I do? You know, what, what else would you do? Exactly. What time even mean? <laughs> yeah, and that's how it became for me, where it was like it be, it was this urge to like really find out, to really awaken, and then it became this like, well, well, what if you know? Because it was four months of like constant, which was it doesn't seem like a long time in the grand scheme, but when you're like meditating a lot, almost all day long for four months, asking who am I, and not really there's not really a measurable like getting somewhere. So you, there's a lot of frustration that goes into it too. Um, there definitely was a time maybe sort of midway where I'm like, fuck, what if I never figure this out? Like, what am I going to do? You know, what if I just never know? And that again was so healing for me because then it was like, it didn't matter how long it took me. I, at that point, it wasn't to get to an end. It was to continue to ask because I was so curious whether I ever knew the answer or not. The the, the passion of, of really investigation became the journey. It was the journey, not the destination at that point for me. And that has never stopped. It's still the journey and not the destination. And sure, there was parts of it along the way, like year two, where I was like, when am I going to, okay, I, I woke in, but now when am I going to get like total freedom and be enlightened and, and thinking that way. And then that, when that dropped, it was like psh, nothing at, after that was about any sort of destination. Like I would be, uh, I would be appalled that this would ever end because this is the coolest 
journey and quest I can ever be on in my life. And it, it doesn't feel like it has an end. It feels like there's always things to work out. There's always things to discover. And that is so exciting to me. But the question is, what, what am I without all this stuff that doesn't, that, that isn't always me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's a real question. Because when mm -hmm. you were saying that, I thought, oh no, what if, what if it isn't anything? What if, what if awakening doesn't exist? That, that doesn't matter. The question is still valid, mm -hmm. which is, what am I? It's not about, it's not about an answer. It's not about a goal. It's not, not about the Experience all the way. I don't even know that exists. Yeah. But the question exists what am I without all this stuff, all these labels, all these emotions, all these. Yeah, absolutely. Mm hmm. Yeah, totally. That, that is a fact. Yeah, that's a valid, that's a valid question. Absolutely. Nothing is take that away. Mm hmm. Whereas I, I want to awaken. It can quite easily be taken away before it doesn't exist. Exactly. Who wants to awaken? It's, it's, it's what this is. It's like, it's, it comes from, it comes from something already awakened in you, right? Ultimately that's what happens, right? Something awakens and then we spend years covering it up or trying to figure it out or whatever we do. Right. And it's just trying to fully awaken. It wants to fully awaken, but the seeds already been planted somewhere along the way. Like the seed for me was planted long before I even knew about non-duality and I felt it, but I got married instead and I tried to fortify my life instead and it failed, right? But that seed was, in, it was a heart-based awakening. It already was there. And then we find ourselves on this path and our mind gets a hold of it and goes, oh my God, I want to awaken. And it becomes this whole intellectual journey when ultimately, what it started at and what it will always end at and what it will what it always actually is is a heart's yearning for truth and your mind will never understand that so that's why it's not a thought at all and the answer won't be in thought at all so when you when you can when you sit with who am i and you answer you uh, see thought as thought eventually it's quiet enough to be left with the radical intimacy of the heart, the presence of what is right here. And that unfolds itself, but it needs that space. It needs that intention to redirect your attention to the heart's yearning for truth and not the mind's desire for truth. Desire will always come with aversion. Yearning doesn't come with anything but yearning. And the yearning is what I'm talking about that has never ended for me. And I hope it never ends because it's the most precious thing to always be directed towards truth. If I want to awaken, it's quite easy to become an entity, I guess. Absolutely. I mean, you were talking about your teacher. Yeah, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm. When it becomes something you can get, it's also something you can lose because it's dualistic, but this is beyond getting or losing. This is what you fundamentally already are. There's nothing that owns it. The, the only way I could lose this is to lose myself, in which case the question's gone anyway. So if I get quite deaf and find out that I'm not there anymore, then I, I can't, well, I can't find that out. So the question is <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't exist. The first thing's not going to be, does that, what am I saying? Yeah. How do I work that out? <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, so okay. as long as I'm aware of me, I'm aware. <laughs> yeah. There is awareness. There is this question. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what am I without all the stuff? I like this world that kind of there's a lot of intense emotion has been arising. Sure, sure. And at some point, you know, I do maybe it's the perimenopause and it's all just that. But maybe it is also just stuff coming up now because it's kind of ready to come up. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that yeah, this is a very emotional journey for me. It was, yeah. 
And I thought, well, either way, you know, I can make use of that and just be with that and try and, you know, totally. if, if it is all the same, that's still kind of gone from somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think there just as a quick pointer, the the biggest thing that I find really valuable is that when you're sitting with who am I and you're working in thought gate, right? In consciousness gate, in the space in which thought arises, and you get a memory or you get emotional, give yourself time to lay down and just feel the emotion. And you know, I don't personally think it's valuable to ask like who's feeling the emotion right now? To me, that denies the expression of the full embodied expression of that emotion. And all it needs is you to mother the hell out of it and just say, You're, it's okay to cry right now. Whatever you feel is totally okay. And let yourself die into the emotion in that moment. Let it be, give your whole body to it the best you can. Even if there's resistance, let the resistance be there. It's all just have that full, like chaotic expression of emotion, however it wants to come out, right? And when it calms, when that wave calms, you sit up again where you get food and water and then you sit up again and you and you look at thought again, who am I, right? My, big, my biggest point is to not, when you're radically in that emotion body, let it be what it is. Don't, don't investigate it with thought. Don't like who is feeling this? What is this emotion? Just feel it, just feel. That's why I feel that and it's like, mm -hmm. it's it's coming up from the body. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's it's partly it's partly the um, ebb and flow of it, right? Because like when you're resting in, in awareness, you could say, or or investigating in consciousness, you could say, that there's enough there becomes enough space for the emotions that have been shoved under the surface for so long to express. So that's a part of that that journey. That's a part of letting them be there because now there's enough space and there's enough de-identification with the self in that moment for it to go oh i can i could fit here right but when we're so mind identified and so in a, like almost ignorance pattern of that our body is feeling things then we're not our, our these poor emotions are just trapped there just saying hello they're just like please can i have your body so i can just move in the way i naturally need to move right they're natural emotions are natural and they won't la the the more and more they come from being repressed to expressed, they don't um, they're not as intense. They don't last as long. Like I've had experiences in the the later stages now where I feel like intense sadness, really, but my eyes barely even water, and I can get one tear out. Like it's not that expressive. It doesn't need that much expression. Right. And there's other times where I'm sitting in freaking sorrow. It happened two weekends ago where I'm just sitting there and it's just sorrow passing through the whole universe was sorrowing through my body. And it was very beautiful, but it was a lot of tears. Right. But without repression, you know, and things sort of get expressed more often emotions, the relationship with emotions is just totally different. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It really does. Yeah. But really focus on thought. And if, well, not focus on thought, but if thought arises, identify that thought. Push it aside, but not pushing emotions aside. Not, I think also um, sensations can have emotions trapped with them. So, or often you can. Yeah. Emotions, so they, they're more likely to mothering. I yeah. really agree with that. Totally. Yeah, totally. But accepted. Yeah. The thoughts need to be accepted. I would say, I would say in a, to an extent, yes, I, I would caution to push them aside versus uh, move towards them. Yeah. Because pushing aside is a lot of effort when really attention wants to move towards it. So you can, when you move towards thought, you really get to see it for what it is, right? So let's take this coaster. This is really a cool coaster, by the way. It says, I meditate, I do yoga, and I still want to smack someone. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So say this is a thought, okay? And it's like, hello, hello, you listen to me, look at me, look at me. And I'm like, ah, that's just a thought. But it comes back. Yeah, excuse me, um, hello. And I'm like, that's just a thought. I'm trying to do, can you mind, do you mind? I'm trying to do something over here. I'm trying to be in awareness over here. Do, do you mind? You know? And then it's like, but what happens when I go, wow, 
Okay, that's a thought. Okay. All right. And back into awareness, naturally we go. Attention goes. By looking at something, it dissolves itself. By giving it attention, it dissolves itself. But ignoring it, is, it's the same thing as repressed emotion. It's repressed thought. So don't create a habit of repressing thought, but you don't have to identify with it, right? So there's the three things that could happen. There's the throwing the thought out, trying to disregard it. There's the looking directly at it and seeing it for what it is. And then there's the, oh, I'm the thought. This is all about me. <laughs> you know? So the, the one in the middle, the middle way is always, uh, I, I caution to say the best way, but middle way is always very valuable right? To just see it for what it is. Like it's, it's not a threat to you if you see it for what it is. Yeah. It's a, it's a subtle shift to be like, you know what I'm like, well, on my body. No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and you can, you can sort of some, th that one, that one's probably easy to sort of uh, not throw out, but, but look at, and it dissolves quicker, but some of them are more, more sticky. So moving, like you can imagine like, moving towards it. What is it? What happens when you move towards it? Cause it's not, it's only solid when you're like not looking at it. It's only something solid. Again, it dissolves when you move towards it on its own, but it's that resistance. That's like, I'm over here and I don't want those thoughts. And it's keeping us solid here. And it's keeping the thought solid. And it's creeping this like tension, like this backward magnets. Right. But if you really just move towards it, look at it, it naturally, the magnets naturally go. So if I say, when our mind got control of the body, mm -hmm. the thought, and I say, well, I don't feel like I'm experiencing the So Look at it. Look at the thought. I feel like I'm experiencing a body. You can even, if you feel compelled, whichever one, to investigate that. I feel like I'm experiencing a body. Okay, who feels like they're experiencing a body? Who am I? It doesn't, when that thought says, I feel like I'm experiencing a body. Aren't you curious who's the one that's experiencing the body? So it brings you back into the who am I, right? Well, wait a minute, who am I? And you just hold that thought, like keep it there on the screen. It's almost like a whiteboard, right? You don't need to erase it right away. You just go, wow, what is it? What is it actually made of? Right? We sort of did it in the beginning of session today where it was like, does it have a substance to it? Does it have a quality to it? What actually is a thought? When you really know what a thought is experientially, the relationship changes. Just like when you really know what emotion is, the relationship changes. But when we keep distance, we keep identification. Because in distance is separation in space. And there's identification. In anything dualistic in that way, there's me and then there's a thought that I got to get rid of versus merging that me just by natural curiosity of like, what actually is it? What actually am I? And I promise you, you don't need any of those thoughts to go anywhere to know who you are again to remember who you truly are. Those thoughts are not your, your problem. It's the relationship to the thought that is the problem, is that you think that you're a someone that is thinking, that those thoughts reference you. That's the problem, if there is a problem. That's what's creating the suffering, is that distance. Me and my thought, me and my thought. But you are not the thinker either. The thinker is another thought. If I, if I, yeah, that's just a hard one for me to grasp, but it's okay. Yeah. Tr trust, trust that it's absorbed. Trust that, that even though your mind might not completely understand the direction I'm pointing you to trust that there's an instinct, that there's an energetic transmission that will absorb and transmit and unfold exactly how it needs to. Sometimes we can understand intellectually and sometimes we can't, and that's okay but trust that you don't worry about trying to figure it out. Stay in that space of like, wow, I'm really resonating with what she's saying, but my mind is like, wait a minute, I'm confused. 
Just stay in that space. That's okay. More than okay. And that's the space that, that you also can feel the pull away from a teacher. If a teacher is like, well, you're like, whoa, I'm really not resonating with the, what they're saying. Maybe I understand what they're saying. Maybe I'm not really actually resonating. And even with me, you know, maybe sometimes what I say you have, you're not resonating with. Right? That's okay. But trust that not resonating with or resonating with. And that will move this forward. You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to understand. That's a feeling rather than a lack. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you already have that. You know, like that's what you're talking about when you're saying, like, oh, I, I changed teachers because that meditation teacher didn't feel right to me eventually. Or so I noticed some weird stuff and you felt it. It was a feeling based thing. Your mind, you know, makes it a, a storyline and understands it. And that's beautiful. There's nothing wrong with that. But ultimately, the first thing before it became a story about why I left my meditation teacher, it was actually, I felt like something wasn't right. Right? whole list of reasons why, but ultimately, I don't feel the trust. Yep. yep. And all these justifications as to why that is. But yep. Yep. And then what happens is when we don't, when we don't, um, trust our own instinct in that way, which most of us don't. We've never learned this in any part of our development of our life, which now <laughs> we can learn it in non-duality, right? We can learn how to retrust this instinctual knowing. This body moves towards pleasure or and away from things that are not right, right? Not even towards pleasure, but it moves towards um, balance. Uh, I don't know the right word. It moves towards what's right and away from what's wrong, I guess, just in yeah. the simplest terms, right? And so, but, but often what happens is we feel that and then our mind goes, but that doesn't make any sense. But like, I don't want to do the time. I don't want to spend the time to find another teacher. And I kind of like her and I, I'll just stay a little bit longer. And we force ourselves to do what's not actually equanimous for us, right? It's not really actually, it's like well, a waste of time a little bit or something because we're identified with mind. Ultimately, we think I'm someone in here that's choosing this, but ultimately if you can just trust like, I feel like more and more, it's like, it's so, it's so fun for me, but it's more and more in my life that I just, I feel like I move fully from what the body wants. If the body likes it, I move towards it. If the body, like, if the body needs heat therapy, I, I get, I put heat therapy on the body. If the body needs an ice bath, I give the body an ice bath. Like, it's sort of like really trusting that instinctual, what, what this, what it needs. And it's, it's really a cool thing to live from. Cause logically sometimes it makes no sense. Like I recently explored ice baths and, and I logically, I was like, this makes no sense. Like I, there's no, there's no logical sense that I would like this, that my body would like this, but my body did not want to get out of the ice bath and it wanted to get in the ice bath again. And I was like, my, my mind was so puzzled, but I was just like, okay, I'm trusting this experience, this instinct that knows way better than my mind. So often instinct is not logical, but we try to logically talk ourselves into pushing our boundaries, basically pushing our boundaries. Yeah.